Job chapters 9 to 10 through the Bible. Part 2. Job's heart cry for Christ. For he is not a man, as I am, that I should answer him, and we should come together in judgment. Job 9.32. Job is saying in effect, if he were a man, I could talk to him. This is the reason God became a man. My friend, so man could talk to him and walk with him and realize that he cannot meet God's standards. The only man who ever met God's standards was the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what makes some of the contemporary plays and literature such a curse. They insinuate that Jesus was not only a man, but that he was a sinful man. Liberalism has been saying this for years. However, they cannot find in the Word of God that there was any sin in the Lord Jesus Christ. They find the sin in their own dirty hearts, because Jesus was without sin. Because Jesus was a man, I can go to him. He died for me on the cross, and he shows me by his life that I cannot meet God's standards, that I need a Savior. By his death he can save me. This is what poor old Job was longing for. Neither is there any day's man betwixt us that might lay his hand upon us both. Job 9.33 Job's complaint was that there was no mediator between him and God. His cry is this, Oh, if there were only someone who could put his hand in the hand of God and who could put his other hand in my hand and bring us together. If he could do that, then I would have a mediator. In the New Testament Paul wrote to a young preacher, for there is one God, and one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2 verse 5. The song that says, Put your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee, is only half true. The man of Galilee has another hand, and that hand is in the hand of God. Jesus is God, my friend. He is the God-man. What a glorious, wonderful truth that is. Oh, how Job longed for him. My soul is weary of my life. I will leave my complaint upon myself. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. Job 10 verse 1 Because Job has no mediator, no man to represent him before God, he will just speak in the bitterness of his soul. He is weary of life, and he is going to say exactly how he feels. He is plain and honest about his sad plight and his wretched condition. I will say unto God, Do not condemn me. Show me wherefore thou contendest with me. Job 10 verse 2 God is going to answer him on this before we are through the book. God is going to show Job something about himself, something that all of us need to find out about ourselves. Is it good unto thee that thou shouldest oppress? that thou shouldest despise the work of thine hands, and shine upon the counsel of the wicked? Job 10 verse 3 Job cannot understand why he must suffer, so while there are wicked men who are not suffering. By the way, that was the problem that confronted David. That is a problem that has confronted me. As a pastor I have wondered sometimes why God would let certain wonderful, godly men suffer while at the same time godless men, even men in the church, seem to get by with sin. They seem to get by with it for a time, but I notice that in time God deals with these people. Even so, there are times when we all ask this question. You see, this book faces up to the questions of life. It is right down where the rubber meets the road. Hast thou eyes of flesh? Or seest thou as man seeth? Job 10 verse 4 Job bewails his condition and his sad plight. He wonders whether God really sees him in his true condition. Here is another reason that God became a man down here. Now I have the assurance that there is a man in the glory who understands me. Because he was a man like I am, he knows exactly how I feel. There is not a pulsation that ever entered the human breast that Jesus Christ did not feel when he was here on this earth. My friend, he knows how I feel. He knows how you feel. Are thy days as the days of man? Are thy years as man's days? 
that thou inquirest after mine iniquity, and searchest after my sin? Thou knowest that I am not wicked, and there is none that can deliver out of thine hand. Job 10 verse 5 to 7. Job now begins to defend himself. He is not willing to admit that there is a great sin in his life. He says that he finds himself in a pretty awkward situation. God knows that I am not wicked, and yet I cannot get out of his hand. I must go through all this, and I don't see why I should be put through this. Job was a man who needed a little humility, and God is going to give him that humility. Have you ever noticed that humbleness and patience are qualities that God doesn't hand over to you on a silver platter, with a silver spoon for you to lap it up? You don't become humble that way. Patience and humility are a fruit of the Holy Spirit, produced in your life through trying experiences. God is going to produce both humility and patience in this man Job. In the New Testament we hear about the patience of Job. James writes, Ye have heard of the patience of Job, but he also adds, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy, James 5 verse 11. It wasn't that Job was naturally a patient man, that quality would have increased his self-confidence and his conceit. Actually, Job was not patient. We have seen that his patience broke down, and he is crying out to God in impatience. But when we see the end of the Lord, that is, the outcome of the Lord's dealing with him, then we see that God was making him patient, and God was giving him humility. It is God who does this, you see. I should have been as though I had not been. I should have been carried from the womb to the grave. Job 10.19 Job is back at the thing he started with, and will stay with it part of the way through this book. During this time of testing, death was something that he desired. He felt that death would put him out of his misery. It would get him away from this scene. He would welcome it as sleep, as something that would put him in a place of unconsciousness. Now if you think you can draw something from this book to sustain the doctrine of soul sleep, you are entirely wrong. Job will say before we get through this book, For I know that my Redeemer liveth. Yet in my flesh shall I see God, Job 19 verse 25 and 26. My friend, this book does not teach soul sleep at all. But at this point, Job is wishing that he had never been born. He wishes for complete oblivion. That is something you can wish for, too. Job was not the only one who did that. Elijah wished it. Jonah wished it. The only thing is, it won't do you. One bit of good. To wish you hadn't been born is a complete waste of time. And by the way, wishing you were dead won't help either. No one ever died by wishing. I always suspect that most of us who say we wish we were dead don't really mean it. We are just talking. When people face death, they really want to live. I suspect that if Job had really faced up to it, he didn't really mean he wished he were dead either. But right now he is pouring out his soul, and there is a breaking down of the dignity of this man. God is going to need to get through to his heart. A lot of God's saints today have proud, hard hearts. Sometimes God must deal with us as he dealt with Job.